welcome to this week's vlog. I hope you enjoyed that intro that I did. Um, I haven't done any face-to-face -face vlogging this week because at the start of the week, I had quite a disaster with a retinol that was too strong for my skin. Um, completely my fault. I Basically, I ran out of my sensitive skin retinol, which is from a brand called PCA. It's very, very good and has a very low percentage of retinol in it. That ran out and instead of repurchasing it, I decided to try and cut a corner and checked to see if I had another retinol in my cupboard and found a 1% drunk elephant retinol and just didn't quite think that the jump up from my PCA one to the drunk elephant one would be that big. But actually I think the drunk elephant one, sorry, the PCA one I think is something ludicrous like 0.0001% retinol. And yeah, it was far too strong for my face. And I woke up, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, to basically retinoid burns on my face. I had them all round here and on the corners of my eyes, you might still be able to know. I've covered them up with concealer quite well. Well, the remnants of them. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely didn't put retinol directly on my eyes. I wouldn't ever do that. But I must have either put too much retinol on or put it on too close to my eyes. I just woke up and all my eyelids were swollen. They were cracking and peeling. It was disgusting. So I thought rather than subject you to that and have to um, subject myself to it when editing the vlog, I just decided I'd do a nice little intro. But as you can see, I'm looking better. This is day six of the retinol disaster. My face is still very tight. It feels like really, it feels like someone's pulling my skin back constantly and just setting it alight. The whole, this whole week it's just felt like it was on fire. Anyway, um, I, today I was like, I'll, I'll put on a bit of concealer just to try and hide. Um, most of the redness is gone, it's just extremely, extremely rough and feels quite cracked. Anyway, this is a really dull story that you didn't ask to hear. As I mentioned in last week's vlog, this week I wanted to do some spring outfits, which felt really appropriate at the time, but now the weather's done a complete 180 and it's back to winter. So I'm going to do more transitional looks in the vlog. I probably will only do about three to four looks and each look will feature a different styling technique, shall we say, that makes it appropriate for transitioning into spring. Sometimes when I watch people's lookbooks, you know, like a spring lookbook or a transitional lookbook, I feel like they miss the point of explaining why said look is good for transitioning into spring so I'm going to try and feature sort of like some techniques that I use in this weird like in between limbo stage that help me kind of I guess stay warm still but also feel like I'm I feel a bit more spring like you know feel a bit more reinvigorated and refreshed within my wardrobe so yeah that is what I will do next Hopefully this setup is okay. I thought this would be much better than doing it handheld because if I, was, if I was doing it handheld, I'd probably end up giving you all motion sickness by panning up and down continuously. So even though you can see my lovely tripod and camera setup, at least you can see the entire outfit and it's stable. I'm also next to the microphone, which means the sound will be a little bit more improved. Okay, transitioning tip number one. So as we edge closer to spring, there are still quite a few days where you find yourself needing a very heavy coat and a hat like I'm wearing here. And I think my first tip to kind of make outfits that still feel very heavily wintry feel a little bit lighter and a little bit more spring light is by introducing some lighter coloured denim like I have here. Now, whenever I wear white jeans, I do get several people commenting saying that they're not sure about white denim, they don't really know how to style it, they're a little bit cautious about it. I don't know if that is just because of difficulty styling it or worrying about getting it dirty. Probably the latter because white jeans are a bit of a nightmare to keep clean. But I think we don't automatically think of white jeans as something to wear in the winter. However, I think introducing lighter denim into your wardrobe Especially like when, if you're like me and you wear a lot of ominous outfits during the winter, lots of black, lots of grey, lots of navy and brown, bringing in a lighter shade of denim is a really nice way to make something feel a little bit spring-like. Now let me introduce you into beige denim. So these are the weekday row jeans. I like to call these the longer than usual jeans. I think these are a leg 30 and I'm pretty sure 30 is the shortest that they do in the row style. 
I wouldn't even call these a crew. I'd say these are more of a sandy beige color. So they are a lot more warm toned. They're not as stark as white denim and they don't feel as much of a contrast when worn with black and darker colors, which I really, really like. They're a much softer way to introduce something lighter into your wardrobe. Sometimes when I wear white jeans with say like black or gray or you know dark brown like I have here, it feels like a very stark contrast. Um, and kind of, I don't know, it doesn't feel very harmonious. Whereas with this beigey coloured denim, I don't know if it's going to show up as beige on camera. It is a little bit. Feels a lot softer and a little bit more subdued in comparison to white jeans. But I feel like, I mean, I've lived in these jeans for about the past week and a half now. And they've definitely given me a little bit more spring in my step when I've been getting dressed because they're just such a nice change to the usual black jeans or navy tailored trousers that I've been wearing. So that's styling tip number one. I'm not going to go through entire outfits. I'm just going to show you like the, the main sort of element of the outfit that I want to showcase, but credits for everything that I'm wearing, including my lovely running trainers that I've just started wearing as my day to day trainers. I'll also credit them. Transitional outfit number two. So as soon as the weather hits double digits, the first thing I always want to do is get rid of the winter coats and bring out my trench coats. However, we all know that no matter how lovely it looks outside, looks can be very deceiving, especially when the sun is out and it all feel, it looks very spring-like outside, but more often than not, there is still quite a chill in the air. So a great way to wear your trench coats while still keeping warm, but without having to bundle up and wear loads of layers underneath is by putting a liner on underneath. Now this padded one is from a brand called Align. I think I got this back in October. I'm pretty sure I raved about this quite a lot on a vlog because I was so in awe of it and was kind of kicking myself that I hadn't got a liner sooner because it's so practical, so brilliant for putting underneath pretty much anything. This one in particular is great because it's really lightweight and it's quite thin and slim fitting. So it sits underneath, obviously oversized coats really well, but it sits underneath more slim fitting coats really well as well without feeling overly bulky. Um, I also feel like I don't look bulky because there's also that thing where you kind of put something a bit too padded underneath a coat and then you feel like you look like the Michelin man. With this, I don't feel like you can tell I've got a padded jacket underneath. Um, so it's a very nice sort of illusion. But also because it's, it is a very nice looking liner, it's got a very nice pattern on it. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I'll get closer. If you do get a little glimpse of it, it does make for a very nice interesting detail to an outfit. Now, what was I going to say? I've lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, so underneath, I'm actually gonna take my uh, coat off because it'd be easier to show you the liner then. So I think the key is to make sure the liner is quite thin. Don't worry about the thinness being a reflection of how warm it will keep you. These kinds of things are designed to be quite lightweight. They're really good for sitting underneath uh, like suit jackets and blazers as well. So the idea is that they sit quite close to the body and they're quite thin so that they don't bulk up underneath what you're wearing. Um, this one's quite boxy, but because it's quite thin and lightweight, it still sits very close to the body. And then underneath, all I'm wearing is a really thin uh, merino wool jumper. So that's three quite thin layers, and I am pretty toasty, um, I have to say. So it's a really good thing to pop on underneath those lightweight jackets when it's still not quite warm enough to just go out in like a jacket and a jumper. Annoyingly, I think this one is sold out because it's... It would, yeah, it was from like sort of autumn time. I will check obviously and I'll leave links and I'll also look for some alternatives because I'm sure there are still some liners knocking about on the internet somewhere that I can link to. So yeah, that's transitional tip number two. Sorry if the light's got a bit funny. It's now sort of mid afternoon and the sun is moving quite quickly. So I'm gonna try and whiz through this while I've still got the light facing me. Okay, transitional look number three is another classic case of wanting to wear something lighter, but it not quite being warm enough. So I need to layer something underneath to make it a little bit more practical. In this case, it is the turtleneck underneath the shirt technique. Now, I love wearing a turtleneck underneath a shirt. So I'm gonna show you a couple more variations as to how I would wear this look because I think it's really easy to incorporate with jeans, tailored trousers, a skirt as I have here. It's also really handy, uh, you can do this under dresses as well which I think is great. 
So the key is, very similar to the liner in the previous outfit, is to keep the turtleneck as thin and as slim as possible because if you're, firstly, if, when you layer things, you just don't want to feel big and bulky, do you? You want to feel comfortable. So if it's nice and slim and um, form-fitting, it's going to sit close to the body and it's not going to all bunch up underneath your shirt. Secondly, if you plan on tucking it in, you want to keep those layers thin so that you don't get those bunching around here and it's not all uncomfortable. I'm wearing a Uniqlo, uh, this is a Merino wool one, this is very thin. I know their heat tech ones are also very thin. So Merino wool is really good because it does keep you warm. And also the heat tech range from Uniqlo is obviously great because it's designed to keep you warm as well. So yeah, just look for something as thin as possible, really. Um, I With the shirt on, over the top, I like to keep the shirt quite loose and oversized, but I think it could work with something more slim fitting as well. I've paired it with a very long, thin pencil skirt. Um, I think this look would actually look quite nice with some sandals as well, but I've just put it with boots for a bit more practicality at the moment. I feel incredibly smart in this. Um, right, I'm going to go change into look number two of this um, technique. I'm wondering whether this is a little bit too preppy. Maybe I should have put DMs on instead of um, loafers. But I've got them on now, so I'll just stick with it. And I think this is a good way to illustrate how the turtleneck under the shirt technique works across lots of different styles. I also think this would look really nice, like a cream turtleneck would look really good with a white shirt and some big, um, not necessarily big, but like some slouchy light denim and maybe like trainers or DMs. I also think this colour combo looks really would look really cool if these jeans were slightly slouchier, maybe with my studio nooks and moon stars, um, but I just thought it'd be nice to illustrate how it looks with jeans. I will now pop it on with some tailored trousers and choose a different colour combination of shirt and turtleneck to show you. This is a much better representation of how I would wear it with jeans. I was just looking back at the footage of that last outfit and I thought it's really nice, but I don't think I would genuinely wear that combination together. This feels a bit more me. Ecru denim, black turtleneck with a black shirt um, and some brown shoes. I actually really like this. I just sort of threw this together thinking, ah, this will be nice. And now I've sort of made an outfit that I actually really quite like and haven't considered before. Right, and lastly, tailored trousers. And voila, tailored trousers. This is definitely my favorite way to wear this look. I love how masculine it looks and it looks like something out of one of the rose lookbooks, which is pretty much where I get most of my outfit ideas from. Another little trick to share with you is sleeveless turtlenecks are also great for this type of layering. This one in particular that I'm wearing underneath this shirt is sleeveless. It's from COS. I think I got this last summer. The annoying thing is, is that sleeveless turtlenecks don't seem to be something that you come by very often. I certainly don't see them very often, but they're great for this type of layering because they keep the main bulk of your body warm, but keep your arms um, and your armpits, more importantly, uh, breathable. I've just got a couple more little just bits to show you, some little spring bits to show you, and then that will be the fashion segment of this vlog done. I'm just gonna do this one handheld because I really want to be able to show you up close the detail of this vest. Now, I know I said I wasn't gonna do anything too high spring and I wasn't gonna show you anything new either, but I really, really, really want to show you this vest and just this entire outfit. So. This vest is, um, it kind of fits in with, I guess, the sort of styling technique uh, nature of this video. So knitted vests, when it comes to spring, are like one of my go-tos. Last year, I feel like that's all I wore. And I will insert a plethora of images now around me just to showcase how obsessed I became with knitted vests because they're so good for that like in-between weather when it's kind of like low twenties because you can throw on a jacket, um, and you just, it keeps you warm still, but just an absolute um, gem. What's going on with that bit of hair there? So this one's from COS and it's been loaned to me for part of that project that I'm doing with them next week, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. And I think I have to send this back next week. I really don't want to. I might actually message them asking if I can keep it because I'm so obsessed with it. If they don't let me keep it, I'm just gonna buy it because I cannot, get over how beautiful this vest is. So I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this. Yeah, you can. So it's actually navy, but it's probably gonna show up as black on camera. And it's this really thick, heavy rib and has this very beautiful sort of uh, 
shaped panelling detail around the breast area. So it's actually quite flattering on um, boobs, <laughs> basically. It kind of has this shaped bit here. I'm not wearing a bra with it at the moment. Um, just because it's so tight, I don't feel like I actually have to wear a bra with it. It is just gorgeous. It's really high necked, which is what I like in a vest. And it's also quite, um, these bits here are quite wide. So I know that for many, many people, this kind of armpit area can be quite an insecurity because it, you know, with age, there comes a lot of, um, you know, you know what I mean. So sometimes when vests are a little bit too slim up here, I don't like how much of my armpit is on show, but this covers that. Um, I'm not doing a very good job of it showing that right now, but it pretty much covers that pit bit. It's just so, so beautiful. And I've paired it with these barrel leg jeans, which are also from Cos, which I'm utterly, utterly obsessed with. I've paired it with Birkenstocks, but actually I put it on with my Dr. Martins the other day. I'll insert an image here and was just like, okay, I want to, I want it to be like 22 degrees and I want to be able to wear this outfit outside because I was just obsessed. Um, I'm actually going to show you this, the vest untucked because it's, it's really not doing it justice on the camera right now. Because it's so form fitting and such like a heavy weight rib, it just creates some really beautiful lines and some beautiful shapes. And it's one of those ones that actually I think can look quite nice untucked as well, because you just get this really nice, these really nice folds and it creates a really nice shape. I think this will look really good with like untucked like this with some big slouchy denim trousers um, or tailored trousers. But I do like it as well with these barrel legged jeans. Just put it on with my Birkenstock for the time being. But yeah, I just really wanted to rave about this vest because I think this is definitely gonna be something that you're gonna see me wear a hell of a lot during spring. Um, so I guess this is just sort of like a, a PSA for anyone else who's a big fan of heavyweight ribbed vests. Um, sorry, just didn't know what I was doing there. Didn't think the camera was in focus. It's that time again, the end of another vlog. This vlog was extremely short, very unlike me. I don't know what has happened this week. I just managed to kind of wrap it all up in under half an hour, which is unheard of for me. So let's talk bullet journal. I'll keep it short and sweet because I'm not the, the, the prettiest of bullet journalists and I certainly don't, um, do any sort of fancy layouts or anything like that. I mostly wanted to rave about a new journal that I'm using. So for the past two years, I've been using the Leustrum gridded, uh, not gridded, sorry, dotted journals. Um, they look like this, they're very, they've got a proper like hard cover. And these tend to be the bullet journal. Like this is the most commonly used bullet journal within the bullet journaling world. And for the most part, I have really enjoyed this journal. However, I don't really like the colours that this journal comes in, which sounds uh, like such a silly little reason to not like something, but I just don't like the colours and it really bothers me. Um, I've always picked navy, but I've kind of always been a bit like, meh. So I thought this year I would treat myself to a new journal and it is this one from a brand called MD Paper, also known as Midori, um, a Japanese stationery brand. This journal is absolutely beautiful, as expected with Japanese stationery brands. They're always just so, just exquisitely minimal and just, the, it's like the kind of stationery that you kind of don't want to use because it's so beautiful. I don't know if I've got the paper that it came with. It came in this, oh I do, I've still got it, yes. So it arrived with like the most beautiful sleeve on it. Can you see? Um, and I haven't thrown it away because I get a bit funny about stuff like this that is just so beautiful. I'm like, I, I could use that somewhere, somewhere later in life. I don't know when, knowing me, I'd probably frame it, won't I, and put it in the toilet or something. Anyway, this, the reason, so yeah, the reason I changed Switch Journal is just because I was a bit like, just fed up with the colour of the Leustrum ones. This one is gridded, just like the Leustrum one. But the thing that I'm really, really enjoying about this journal is the, uh, what do you call this? Like, a, it's almost like a naked spine. It doesn't have the 
kind of hard bit that you'd normally get. It's just completely exposed, which means it lies completely flat, which for someone who is left-handed, this is quite an appealing feature because other left-handed people will sympathize with me that writing on journals can be quite difficult. Um, if you're right-handed, you won't have a clue. You're lucky, you're lucky so-and-so. But yeah, sometimes when you're left-handed, it does become, sometimes writing in a pad can have its discomforts. So I find that because this sits so flat, I don't have any of those troubles. Second thing I like about this is, so the Loistrom journal has a tassel, which is very handy. It comes with two tassels, so you can keep tabs of uh, where you're at within your journal. The MD paper one doesn't have that. However, it does have this sort of tear away tab system, which, so once you've done, once you're finished with a page, you can just, let me see where I've actually finished one. You can just tear off the tab and then eventually you'll, you'll end up with like a big thick chunk of tabs that are broken away and you can sort of see where you're at. Um, at the moment, I've literally broken away at maybe like four or five, but you get the gist. It's an easy way to figure out where you are. The second thing I like about it is that it is cream. Um, it is, it kind of reminds me of uh, like Muji stationery, everything's pale cream. However, it's really dirty already, which is um, kind of unavoidable. I do have a special sleeve for it though. So MD Paper do uh, some really nice leather covers that will patina so beautifully over time, I think. And they're the type of covers that you can just take off and then use for your next journal. Um, so you don't have to repurchase them. You can just sort of take them off and keep using them. Sorry, I'm gonna look for that plastic sleeve. Oh, see it. So I did kind of um, predict that I would get it dirty, especially if I have it in my handbag, I can imagine it will get really dirty. So I brought this plastic sleeve um, that it can sit in just because I, I don't know, I just didn't fancy committing to a cover. I thought a sleeve might be quite cool. Oh my God, I can't, <laughs> I can't get it in. It needs a little bit of wearing in, but, oh, there we go. Once it's in, it sits in this plastic sleeve very nicely. So when it's in my handbag, um, it will, you know, be protected from all the potential dirt that could ruin it. But you can see on the back already, I've got quite a lot of ugh, stuff on it. So I need to put it back in its protective case more often. They are expensive, however. They are 35 pounds, I think. But here is, I'll compare the two sort of side by side. So with the MD paper one, firstly, you get a lot more pages. In this one, you get, I think it's 300 and, 65 pages. I'm pretty sure you get one page for every day of the year. The Loistrom one you get, let's see, 250 pages. So you're getting a lot more paper for your money. Um, it, I think the paper weight is probably the same as the Loistrom one. Actually, no, I think the MD paper one's a little bit heavier. Um, but to be honest, I, I mean, I, I bought this mainly for aesthetic purposes and because I thought it looked a lot nicer. But yeah, the it's almost double, yeah, pretty much double the price of the Loistrom one. So it is quite a spenny uh, piece of stationery. But for me, my bullet journal is my lifeline when it comes to keeping myself organised and productive. Literally, my whole soul is poured into my bullet journal. I rarely use the notes on my iPhone. I use the calendar because I share the calendar with my manager. Um, so sh that's the only time I use the calendar. The rest of my brain and keeping it organized is all encapsulated within this book. Um, I haven't actually done much bullet journaling so far because obviously January, I mean, it felt pretty pointless bullet journaling in January. I didn't, to be honest, I didn't want to waste the pages. <laughs> And then the start of Feb was very slow. So I have left the first page blank because I'm still toying with the idea of either doing a contents or some sort of um, a contact details page. Then I go into my yearly sort of planner. So I split the pages into months and then within those months, I write down key things. At the moment, so far, 
it's mainly just birthdays that are in there. Nothing, nothing happening. Um, I've left some pages blank so I can continue the year on. Then I have my pen log. This is probably my favourite page within my bullet journal because it is where I log all the pens that I like or don't like and then I can refer back to them when I need to repurchase or when I just fancy a new pen, I can go back to this and remember, oh yes, the Muji 0.7 pen was a dream. Um, or the Faber Castell B is only good for big writing. <laughs> Then how I lay out my weeks or like my months. So I start off my month by doing a, that's actually a really rubbish example. That one was a bit scruffy. Start off by, with my month looking like this. I do a linear calendar and then I just write like things that are going on that month. And then each week I kind of split my week like this. So I have the week commencing at the top. Then I start, uh, I kind of put like top tasks Sorry, and then split it into days. It's it's really quite basic. It's nothing like you see on Pinterest. I mean, I go on Pinterest sometimes to try and get inspiration, and I last about an hour, and I'm like, nope, I haven't. I don't have the patience to make my bullet journal look like that. But it is nice to just admire uh, some of the beautiful beautiful bullet journals that you find on Pinterest. So that is how bullet journaling looks for me so far. I've started a spring wish list. I also, oh I haven't done it in this one, I normally have like a TV and movie list where I jot down lots of things that people recommend so that I don't forget them. Um, a project tracker where I track my projects for the year. Um, I usually actually have like a, a bills tracker as well, which I need to do, and um, kind of like a money in, money out tracker. So that is my bullet journal so far, uh, but yeah the main uh, aim of this chat was just to show you my actual journal. Okay, I think I'm going to wrap it up because I've spoken for 10 minutes about my journal. I hope you enjoyed this vlog. Um, not sure what I'm going to do next week. Just see what lockdown, another week in lockdown brings us. So I hope you enjoyed this week's vlog and I'll see you all in the next one. Hello, me again. Sorry, there was something I completely forgot to mention at the end there and something I'm very excited to finally announce. The project that I alluded to last week, which is with COS, many of you guessed correctly, it wasn't really hard, was it? <laughs> is happening next week. It's going live next week. It's a shopping event with Sophia Rowe and COS and we'll be styling the new spring summer collection. I am quite nervous about it just because I've not done anything like this before and I've not created content like this before that will sit on such a big website with such a big brand but I think it will all go quite smoothly the event. Um, if you are interested in signing up or just finding a little bit more information about what's happening next week I'll leave some details in the description box there's like a link you can follow to sign up. If you are already on the COS mailing list though I think you will get an email um, giving you like specific times and when you can join the event um, but it's Tuesday the 9th of March and it will probably be around about 3 p.m or 4 p.m UK time um, but that hasn't been 100% confirmed yet I don't think so yeah I just wanted to add that in because sorry there was a, a weird noise yeah just wanted to add that in because I completely forgot and I'm so like excited and chuffed about it so yeah anyway that's me done <laughs> see you all next week